Hey everyone, it's Bernardo Moya, founder of The Best Jew, author of The Question, and uh, another, another episode today of Inspiring People. And uh, today I've got the pleasure of uh, connecting, interviewing, uh, in a little bit more detail. I already met Christine a little while ago, but today it's Christine Erickson. Hey Christine, how are you? I'm doing great, thanks Bernardo. You doing okay yourself? I'm doing great, thank you so much. Yes, yeah, safe. Um, and, um, and yeah, excited to, to have an opportunity to dig deep into kind of what you've done in your career. So Christine has a bachelor's degree in nursing and a master's degree in counseling psychology. Christine has been working with adults and children in various settings in uh, St. George since 2011. From her work with clients as well as personal experience, Christine has helped adults and children cope with divorce, death, loss, addiction, trauma, uh, reactive attachment disorder, ADHD, behavioral issues, sleep problems, anxiety, depression, bipolar, autism, Asperger's OCD, and schizophrenia. So she's a very, very knowledgeable lady. Uh, Christine combines her training with her personal experience and empathy uh, for other individuals and families as she helps others find practical tools to cope with their unique challenges. Well, Christine, uh, congratulations on all the things that you've done and all the things that you're doing. Thank you. I appreciate it. So tell me a little bit more about you. Where, where's Christine from? Where were you born? And tell me about those early years. Um, what was okay. That like? Right. Um, so I grew up in northern Utah and um, pretty uneventful upbringing. But I, I lived in, you know, in the same city my whole life up until I got married and left home. So I... I really wasn't sure what I wanted to do once I graduated high school. And so I kind of like threw a dart at the board. I knew I wanted to do something helping other people. And, and so I got into nursing, but then as I was working as a nurse, um, I kind of struggled a little bit to feel like I fit in and kind of found myself in one particular job, eyeing the social worker's job. And so I ended up going back to school years later and, and ended up count, doing counseling psychology. So I, I really enjoyed it and um, and so glad that I went back to get my master's degree because it's been um, really rewarding to work with a lot of different people and helping people in a lot of different situations. I'm sorry, Bernardo, you're muted. Yeah, sorry. So I'm, I was saying that, that personally, I, I feel that um, um, People find their calling maybe late in life. Sometimes it's a turning point. So, some people know from, you know, from very young. You know, for me, right. for example, I wanted to be a pilot. And it, I was obsessed. I don't know why, but I wanted to be a pilot. It never happened. Um, so right. was, it, was it something in particular that, that you enjoyed doing at school? Was this, was this something that you were drawn towards? What got you to do what you do now? So when I... When I was working as a nurse, well, one year I worked as a school nurse in an inner city school in Indianapolis, and I, um, I just found myself, you know, kind of watching what the social worker was doing and, and really kind of wanting to, to talk about all these social issues and about managing emotions and, and being able to deal with problems instead of just dealing with the body. And even though the body is, a, is an important part of our being as well. And a few years after that, we, we traveled, my husband was in the military, we traveled to Okinawa, and I had read Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning, and that was a really, that had a really powerful impact on me. And I was talking with a friend about wanting to, to do something related to helping people through counseling, and, and she said, oh, guess what, there's a, there's a program on the island, you should, you should check it out. And so... I actually started school there and um, wasn't able to finish there because we had an emergency medical move at the time. One of my children got really sick and so we had to, we had to move and I had to re-enroll in another school and kind of start over, but I was able to, to do that. I was able to get into counseling psychology. So that's kind of how it started. And um, so uh, well, the things that you do now, what, what is it that you, you feel, and I'm, I want to get in, into specific kind of like, you know, how things might have changed with, you know, being closed in at home and, uh, right. and being right. isolated, which obviously is different to, to maybe how things were in the past. So, so what do you think are, are, are the, you know, the struggles that people normally have or, or you've come across with more frequently that, that you've helped and supported people with? 
Um, anxiety and depression tend to be unfortunately really common. And well, when I say common, maybe a better term is they're not uncommon. It's, mm -hmm. it's quite prevalent today. And it was prevalent even prior COVID-19. And so I would say that probably the rates of anxiety and depression have even gone up more dramatically. Mm. And in addition to that, unfortunately, I see a lot of people who have experienced trauma. So the, we get other things. I, I've got plenty of kids that come in with attention deficit, hyperactive disorder. I've, like I said, I've worked with, or like you said, I worked with people with a variety of other mental health diagnosis like bipolar or schizophrenia but really anxiety and depression tend to be the thing that kind of really hit us and and that can show up in relationships and and affect the way that we are in relationships or it affects the way that we are in our, our work and our ability to show up at work and really be effective and so that's really when people come to see me is when a major area of their life is disrupted because of the anxiety, the depression, or whatever it is that they're dealing with, that they're not able to be present in their relationship where they're um, reacting inappropriately because of extreme anxiety, or they're not able to show up to work because they're so anxious, or they go into work and then have panic attacks, or they're too depressed to get out of bed. So, you know, things like that are, are unfortunately not as uncommon as they used to be. And uh, sorry, go ahead. And I think one of the things that is the struggle is as a society, well, it, it, society, you know, it's, it's different from one society to another, but it used to be years and years ago that, that there was a stigma associated with mental health problems mm. that you were weak if you had these type of problems. And so we're, we're beginning to move away from the, that stigma, but it's still something that um, prevents it from, prevents people from coming in to get help. And so that, that's something that is also kind of a barrier to, to people's well-being, I guess. Yeah, and I was actually gonna ask you exactly that. I was gonna ask you about the, the, the stigma uh, around it and, and, and also how comfortable are people to come forward because a lot of well, first of all a lot of the times you know and i suppose i know and i've read a lot of facts you know for example male suicide is one of the biggest killers in, in the uk and right and you know it's that ability to talk to to express and, and to share you know kind of whatever it is that you're going through um and and i don't know i have a feeling that you know kind of in in the us and again this is someone observing that it is opening up people are more forward to say hey you know i have a therapist or or you know i i'm, I'm struggling from my from being a bipolar or having depression but a lot of people struggle to take that step forward to, to ask for help don't they do, do you feel that it's changing is it is are we on the right track now i do feel that there is a big a big shift happening but it, but it just does it's it's like any other major change that we experience as a society it doesn't hit everybody you know so sometimes it hits the group of people that need it here and it doesn't hit the group of people who need it over here and so it's it's something that um is definitely shifting and we do have more openness about talking about it but there still is is just some maybe lack of understanding of, of what depression is really like or what anxiety is really like and and for example, I just spoke with a family um, with their with their young adult daughter the other day, and who was experiencing depression. And her her parents kept telling her to be happy, to think positive, to be happy. And and I'm trying to explain to the parents that you know it's it's not just it's not that easy to just be happy when you've got um, just biologically your serotonin levels are so low, you the the girl was talking about doing the things that um, we talked about coping skills and the things that she typically likes to do and yes but i'm still sad yes i do that but i'm still sad yes i do that but i'm still sad and and she is she's she's sad even when she's doing those things that she loves and that's part of depression that's one of the signs is that 
you're doing those things that you love and you're not finding that joy and that happiness that you typically experience. And so I think there's, there's still a lack of understanding. And I don't know that that's ever going to go away because it can be challenging because even from one person to another, you can have different experiences like two, two people who experience depression may have a little bit different experience of, of how, of how that shows up in their life. And so, so a lot of times people can feel mis misunderstood, but, but hopefully if people can reach out and get the help that they need, they, they can at least have a therapist that will be understanding or who will listen and try to understand and, and, and want to know what their experience is like and how they can help. And what are the uh, what are the ways to cope with with um, with anxiety, depression? I know you do a lot of things, obviously, uh, to help clients. What what are the main tools that that you try to bring people or bring to people in order for them to? Because obviously, I, I know uh, I know uh, as as someone that comes from 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 Europe, you know, when when I remember the first time I was watching television here and and how they advertise drugs, you know, and, and, and then they spend half their time talking about the side effects and it just shocks me. <laughs> and <laughs> right. how many people are, are then, you know, hooked onto these medications, which is just like, it's just terrible in itself. What, right. what are the, what are the better uh, the best uh, coping mechanisms or tools that people could have or implement in their life to, to reduce anxiety? So, um, so just really quickly, just a note about depression. If somebody is severely depressed, then, then they might need either medication or some particular su supplement to help them get to a level where they can actually do some of the things that we talk about. A huge thing for people who are depressed or anxious is exercise. And I know that it's a little bit more challenging for people right now who are in who are in extreme lockdown, who can't get out of their houses, but exercise is a huge tool for many people to, for mental well-being. And in addition to that, I, I do a lot of mindfulness with my clients and mindfulness is a huge tool for people who are experiencing anxiety. It can be helpful with people who are experiencing depression and, and also it can be helpful to people who have experienced trauma, but if you do have an experience with trauma, then you kind of want to be a little bit careful going into using mindfulness because I, it's kind of a, you know, it's a very personal thing. It depends on how you react to the practice of mindfulness. And it's not, it's not a choice, you know, people with a traumatic past don't, choose to be reactive but sometimes when you sit quietly and you begin a mindfulness practice some of that um, some of that past comes up and it can be a, a disturbing or a or an upsetting experience but there are other people who have experienced trauma that it's very helpful so you just kind of if you do have a, a history of trauma you just need to maybe have someone who can walk you through that and give you some support and make sure that you're doing okay and because there are different mindfulness practices also and some of them can be more helpful where some of them could be potentially triggering and so that's just something that you want to be a little bit careful with okay um now one of the things obviously that i i, I share with people and 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 it's, it's being aware of our thoughts and a lot of the people don't you know kind of appreciate and understand the importance of of that internal dialogue that we might have, you know, and within mindfulness, you know, our mind tends to wander, you know, yes. I think people tend to think that, Oh no, I, I'm mindful. My mind is completely quiet. No, it doesn't happen. Um, but I, I, I mean, it starts really with, with being aware of your thoughts, isn't it? I mean, you know, kind of if, if, if what you're saying to yourself is not empowering or helpful or detrimental or, you know, well, that's the first, I suppose the first steps or the first steps in order to kind of understand the power of the mind or whatever it is that we might be doing to ourselves. So what, what are, what is, what is your advice as, as the starting point to kind of really understand and appreciate, you know what, I, I might need some help here or I might be going through anxiety because, you know, again, we're not born with a manual. We're not born with a manual for our right. mind and say, Hey, this is what you do. They don't teach us these things at schools. We don't know these things with our parents. 
So what, what are the first steps in order to kind of understand that you might have something that you might need some professional help? Well, as I mentioned before, when I, I talked about when something gets in the way of a major area of life. So if you, if you're ang- many of us have anxiety, but if your anxiety is so bad that it's interfering with a relationship, that it's interfering with your ability to go to school, it's a f- interfering with your ability to show up at work, then, then that's a time that you want to get help. Because if, if you're, it, and, and I guess part of this, you can, you can look at your past history. Okay. Things were, it, everybody struggles in relationships periodically, right? But if, Things were going relatively well, and then now they're not, and you're really struggling, and and you're feeling uninvested, or they're uninvested, or someone's threatening to leave. Then obviously that's a, a time that you need to reach out for help. And and again with the the work, if it's affecting your performance at work, and one of the things with depression and anxiety is it affects your ability to focus, and so. It, it can affect you that way at work or at school. And so if you're struggling so, so much that you can't focus and you can't complete what you need to and your performance is going down significantly or you're being called in for a review of performance or something like that, then, then that's time that you ought to think about reaching out and getting some help. Um, so with... Um... With the whole coronavirus and things like that, it's, it's a different world out there now. It's uh, right. It's um, I think the new new now is no is not new anymore, is it? It's it's, it's the new reality. Uh, right. What what do you think? Um, because my, my concern my concern was in in general. I, I understand why it's being done, and I understand why it needed to be done. I we have to stay at home, and I have to isolate. I, I just. Mm-hmm. In particularly think, and I've got these are my own thoughts. I particularly think that they haven't really, and I'm saying governments in general. I, I don't know if they've really kind of taken into account the impact it's going to have, you know, psychologically, you know, for so many people who right. you know, everything is falling, uh, you know, around them. You know, everything's disappearing, and um, and also in kids. I mean, you know, funny enough, in Spain where things were really tough, where you know, literally, you could not leave your home without a written permission and only one from the family. I mean, kids had to stay at home closed in for months. I mean, for, for over right. a month. I mean, it's funny enough, right. you could take your dog out for a walk. You couldn't take your kid out to the park, which was, wow. I, thought was I thought that was ridiculous. Right. <laughs> so what's your thoughts on, 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 you know, because this is going to unfold, isn't it? It's going to unfold in the coming weeks right. and months and years. What, what's your thoughts? <laughs> Well, this is obviously a really broad topic because there's so many different experiences and and some of us are, are very isolated while other people are extremely busy. Um, I've been pretty busy because yeah. I one of my one of my workplaces is a residential treatment facility. And so I have to um, I have to be very careful about keeping myself healthy, but I'm but I'm busy. I'm busy on a regular basis. And so so I'm I'm doing great, <laughs> you know, but but there are many people who are at home that aren't able to do their typical employment. They aren't able to go out and socialize or they aren't able to do their schoolwork. And um and, and given of course there are lots of schools that are going online and so they are able to do quite a bit of schoolwork, but but it changes things and you don't have that interaction like you used to. And so I think that there are a couple of things that you want to watch out for. And um, when, when your life, when your schedule has suddenly completely changed and, you know, the rugs kind of been pulled out from underneath you, you want to maybe think about creating structure for yourself because um, having specific things to do at a specific time can be really helpful. When, when we are working on a regular basis, we have a schedule, we have somewhere to be, we have things that we need to do. And so when we don't have that, we tend to, uh, well, we possibly wander around in circles, waste a lot of time, end up not using our time well, because we are, we, we don't have, something that we have to be to somewhere that we have to be at a certain time. And so 
creating a some type of structure for yourself and that could be okay i need to work out this many times during the week and what does that look like what do i have access to in my home and of course there are many online workouts that you have access to which is one of the um one of the things that isn't so bad right now you've got lots of access to things like that but also um, just doing the regular self-care things like being able to get showered and get dressed as if you are going to work even if you aren't because that helps you feel better about yourself and then creating novelty or interest within your structure so whether it is doing learning a language on Duolingo or learning how to meditate, or do you have access, access to a musical instrument that you can practice? You know, what kinds of things can you add into that schedule, into that structure to create interest for yourself? And of course, finding something productive to do. So if you are working, then that's great. But if you aren't working, what can you do that would help you feel productive? And I know there are many people who have reorganized things and remodeled and done all sorts of projects that they've been wanting to do for a long time. But those are things that help you feel productive and productivity and feeling productivity is, is something that's really therapeutic for all sorts of reasons. So, so those are all things that, that can be helpful having that structure and, and having different things that you can do on a regular basis. But, but I think another thing that's really important is to figure out how you can connect socially. And so that's going to look different for, for everybody, depending on what your circumstances are and, and what your social network is like. But I've got, I've got kids in lots of different circumstances. I've got a, a 22 year old that's living at home and he, he is able to go out and he gets together and socially distances with some of his friends. And, and I have an 18 year old who does the same thing. I have a, a nine year old that I know if she got together with her friends, she would not socially distance. And so they've been doing a lot of Google Hangouts and, and we've been trying to create activities um, for them to do at home to create interest for them. They need the same thing that, that we need as adults. Sometimes we think only our kids need it, but our kids need structure and we need structure as well. And so as, as parents, you know, creating interest and creating something to keep your kids going. For example, this week, it's service week in our family. And on Sunday, we kind of went through a bunch of different ideas and talked about what they wanted to do. And and our kids picked service week. They had to rock, paper, scissors for it because they had a couple of different opinions. But we talked about what that would look like. We talked about like some inspirational movies that they could watch. And then they've got a service contest going on each day. And, you know, there's going to be a winner each day, whoever did the most service for each other. So, so just doing something to, to keep us active and keep us interested and productive so that we so that we don't um, dwell on so many problems that are going on and and that's I guess another piece of it is we need to limit the amount of time that we're spending reading news reading statistics um, following um, social media sometimes and and reading the news because there's a lot of stuff going on and if we focus on all of the, and, and what is news typically? It's usually not good news, right? And, and so the news that's reported, if we're, if we're focused so much on that negative news that we're hearing on a regular basis, that can be really discouraging. And so you want to limit the amount of time that you're spending focusing on that and, and also focus on what you have control over because if you are focused on the fact that we're in a pandemic and it's scary and it's big and the numbers are going up, you know, if you're, if you're thinking of like that, then you're going to be really stressed out. And I think we all fall into that periodically, mm. but you need to recognize that you've fallen into that and you need to kind of pull yourself back and say, okay, what do I have control over? Well, I can wash my hands and I can be aware of where I'm going and who I'm interacting with and what I'm doing. And 
and really just focus on that, what you have control over and, and be kind to others. And it's okay to be concerned about family members and other situations and, and reach out to them. But, but just be aware of where your own mental state is at and, and how you're feeling. If, if what you're doing is creating more anxiety, then maybe you need to take a step back. Great advice. Thank you, Christine. Uh, so what are you working on now? What's, what's your next projects? What, what's, what's keeping you? I know you're busy, but I'm saying it. What are you working on now? What are the exciting new projects you're working on? Well, one of the programs that I'm working on right now, I, I actually have two because one I started pre-coronavirus and then it kind of got paused. So that one is called the Mindful Experiment. And, and hopefully I'll be able to finish that pretty soon with some a bunch of meditations and and just a, a good course on mindfulness. And then the project that I started when that one got paused is a program called Body Forward. And that one is, is really about kind of like you said, being aware of your thoughts and kind of letting go of some of those stories that we tell ourselves about how we should look, how we, uh, you know, there are a lot of worthiness stories that we tell ourselves about our appearance and so I, I'm going to be doing a lot of meditations and a lot of emotional clearing regarding that, as well as helping people develop an exercise plan and talking about nutrition and, and really looking at what is sustainable to help you feel good and, and feel good about yourself and, and be aware of what you need and, and also be accepting of yourself and, and your choices because we make choices all the time and sometimes we don't make the best choice and that's okay. You know, we, we realize that and then we need to move on. So, so that's the program that I'm working on right now. It's, it's just about ready to be delivered. So. Brilliant. Well, listen, we're, we're very excited, Christine, to have you involved in working with the best you. And I know we've got your content on the best you online. So I invite anyone that's interested in, uh, in, in connecting with you. Obviously you're going to share your details now, but come and check it out on the best you online. So Christine, how can people find you and um, what's the best way of connecting with you? So they can find me online at, mindf at mindfullab.net or my therapy website is emotionalhealingtoday.com. And then I'm on Facebook. I've got a Facebook page for emotional healing. And you can also email me at christinecounseling at gmail.com or my phone number if you want to just call me and leave a message because a lot of times we play a little phone tag, but you're welcome to let me know what time I can call you back is 435-767-7945. So I'd well, be happy to hear from you and happy to help in whatever way I can. Well, listen, thank you so much. You, you've done a, you've done a great work. You, a great job. I mean, you know, I, I admire, uh, people like you who obviously are extremely passionate about helping others in so many ways and, and in such an important way in, in helping people, you know, um, well, with, with mental issues and anxiety and, uh, and all the challenges that I think, uh, and if there's any outcome, I think that um, if anything, there's going to be a lot of people reinventing themselves, transitioning into, right. into meaningful right. or ch you know, change careers because it's necessary uh, but right. apart from that, I, I think there's going to be um, a lot of people like yourself who will have um, a lot of people that will need help in, in the coming months and years. So uh, right. yeah. I want to thank you so much, Christine, for, for your great work. Congratulations. Okay. Thank you so much, Bernardo. Thank you so much. And thank, thank you for, uh, thank you everyone for listening today to inspiring people and uh, till we be, till we talk again. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank you.